Welcome to the Valve Studio. This is part three of my interview with Fat Willie, aka Lord Valve. There's seven of these segments. And in this segment here, uh, Willie is talking about uh, part selection. He's also um, uh, talking about uh, NOS or uh, new old stock tubes, but using those versus just regular production tubes. Uh, capacitors and ESR, uh, potentiometers and uh, sockets. He also has a little uh, a pretty, pretty brief discussion about rivets and screws. Um, and uh, it freely admits he's a tube hack and um, that's the way he, how he takes on design and, uh, and Leo Fender and his approach to doing, <laughs> to, uh, to doing design Leo Fenders. Um, and finally, this is a long segment, uh, he talks about uh, chassis layout. So go ahead and uh, you know, sit back and watch this and listen to uh, someone who's been doing this for about 60 years and uh, gain some wisdom from the Lord Valve. Right. Uh, let's talk about, uh, if you're, you make, in your designs, you make the best amplifiers you can make. And then, but you're also a businessman, so you have to weigh the cost of the components or you just, don't even care about the cost of the components and you put in the best thing you can make. I'm pretty well gonna go with that last one there. Okay, and then because of that, what do you end up choosing? For, well, you, you talked about mercury magnetic for transformers. Yeah, I like those, and hay bores. I use a few hay bores. Is that also for power supply? I would use hay bore uh, power transformers because they're cheaper mm -hmm. and they're good. Okay. You know, but uh, alpha transformers, I like mercuries. I really okay. do. What about the... Uh, what about all the reissue versus a, the NOS for driver tubes, or tubes in general? Oh, excuse me a second here. So while he's taking that call, let's go take a look around here at NBS Electronics. Here's the front door on Broadway in Denver. Let's turn around. This is the view you see when you walk in the door. Racks of equipment here. Here's some old audio amplifiers. That's a Hafler 500. I built one of those when I was a junior in college. I still have it. On this shelf here, it looks like it's transformers. A bunch of power transformers, output transformers, probably some chokes as well. And up above here is uh, one of many shelves here in the shop that uh, have speakers. Here's what kind of looks like a Hall of Fame. People have come in and signed their promos, gave them to Willie, and he's got them posted over here on his, on his bulletin board. And there's a picture of Dick Dale. Yeah, the cat sent me a, uh, a Yugoslavian medicine bottle right you know and said he wanted me to give it to Derek trucks okay. he said this is what all the guys in Yugoslavia use oh for slides yeah for slide nice. you know? and Derek was using a core seeding bottle for a while you know a classic slide right okay and the guy sent me a, a Yugoslavian uh what was it Yugoslavian no it's Hungary yeah he sent me a Hungarian uh, medicine bottle he said give it to Derek you know tell him this is what we use over here because you know? they're all they're all Derek trucks freaks over there nice you know? nice uh, so we were uh, we were talking about, but you almost you, the call you just took. You told them about NOS and reissues and on yeah. tubes. So, what what uh, what's your philosophy on that? Well, I you know I'm I'm not a NOS snob. Okay, there are some NOS tubes that are just fabulous. Mm -hmm. I love them. You know, like what? And, and well, uh, if you go for for instance the. Uh, NOS uh, 7581A Phillips, mm -hmm. you know, it's a, basically a 35 watt 6L6 built for the military. Right. Jan 7581A dynamite tube. You can't touch them now for under three, four hundred bucks a pair. Right. I used to buy those from from New Sensor Corporation. I could buy a box of a hundred of them. Okay, for like uh, seven hundred bucks. 
you know they were seven bucks a piece mm -hmm. and i'd retail them for 14 and cats were glad to get them right yep but now you can't touch them they just can't find them you, you can't find, find them, them there, no. they're, they're... now a uh, new sensor mike matthews is building a uh, 7581 under the tongue saw label and I, I i gotta hand it to him now most of the stuff in that line that says tongue saw mm -hmm. is excellent okay really good stuff you know and it's 7581 it when he brought the tube out it said 7581 on it on the box and on the tube mm -hmm. well people on the internet just started bitches oh it's not a 7581 a you know so mike just put the a's on the on the box he just added it to it you know and but yeah. i've had people call me up you know and, and say well, I want some 7581As. I say, well, I got some 7581s. And I say, no, no, I got to have the A. And yeah, I right. say, yeah, but it's the same thing. So, no, it's not. You know, okay. Okay. You know, so I'll charge you five bucks extra for the letter. There you go. <laughs> you know, and Mike, he, you know, it used to be back in the day they had the JDEC, the Joint Electron Device Engineering Council. Right. And if you developed a tube or you improved a existing tube, you submitted it to the JDEC, and they told you what you could call it. So if it was a 12AX7 and you improved it by putting a, a controlled 11-second warm-up time, they say, okay, we'll call this a 12AX7A. Okay. It wasn't right? up to the manufacturers to make it. No. Uh-uh. Okay. They, they did the specs. All you right. Know? So you had to submit it, and they'd say, okay, you can call this. Because uh, they, knew, they knew what numbers were available, mm -hmm. you know, because you didn't want two guys... Two, two outfits making two different tubes are calling the same number. Right, right. You know. So, my, you know, now the JDEC, who, who knows what they do? If I don't even know if they still exist, right? I don't know. So, Mike Matthews, you know, he gets a new tube. And I, that's what I was kidding him about. I said, he, he throws it in a bowl of alphabet soup and he calls whatever letters stick to the glass. That's where, <laughs> that's where you get stuff like 7591XYZ, you know. Uh -huh. WXT plus and all this. I don't know what any of that crap means. You know. And he doesn't either. Oh, well, there you go. So we talked about uh, capacitors a little bit. What about uh, um, uh, filter capacitors? What do you prefer on those guys? I like the uh, F and T's out of Germany. Mm -hmm. uh, JJ is building some good capacitors. All right. Uh, they're too expensive. Uh, you can get I think they, the the F and T's have the edge and they're a little cheaper, so I go for those. You know, mm -hmm. Sprague's. Well, Sprague's aren't really Sprague's anymore. They're built by an outfit I think in Tennessee called Barker Microfarads. Okay. And, and they just uh, brought the Sprague name. Yeah, okay. they, and and they look the same. You know, they're blue and they say Sprague Adam on them and stuff, and they don't suck or anything. But they're real expensive. <clears throat> yeah, yeah. But uh, yeah, the you know electrolytics. There's some snob stuff out there like Blackgate and, you know, audiophile stuff. Mm -hmm. I I can't see it, you know. And one thing that I found that I really like is uh, they have these capacitors there. Uh, God, what, are, what, what are they called? They, they, uh, they're non-polar and they're um, high voltage. You're going to get them 450, 500, 600 volts. Mm -hmm. Pretty... A lot of capacitance, 30, 40, 50 microfarads. Yep. And the ESR on them is like nothing. Oh, okay. It's like 0. 0.0001 ohms, you know. But they're electrolytics? Yeah. Well, no. Well, they're not They're not. They're, they're polymers. They're, okay. I don't know what they are. Right. They're, I've got some sitting in the back there. Are they physically a lot bigger than electrolytic? Not terribly, no. I've got some back there that I think they're... They're 30 at 600, and they're maybe two yeah. inches across and maybe that tall. Okay. And they're nonpolar. Right, right. See? And because of that super low ESR, they can really sock a lot of voltage oh, quick. Yeah. Sure they can. You know? Yeah. So that if you want a real punchy sounding amplifier, that's good for that. Oh, it sure is. Yeah. Yep. Uh, how about pots? <clears throat> You like you know, Alan Bradley? Is there's, Alan Bradley even a name anymore? Or? Uh, yeah, they're, they're still around. I think they still make them. Okay. Um, CTS comes out of China. Mm -hmm. They're made on the same machines. 
I can't tell any difference between them and NOS CTS pots. Okay. Aside from the fact that the the body of the pot has this gold color to it rather than you know regular metal type stuff. Mm-hmm. Uh, the CTSs are good. Uh, the Borns are very nice. And Borns is the uh, back of the pot uh, is eminently solderable. If you have to solder to the back of a pot, Borns are great. Okay. You know, and they're nice. They're made real well. Are those open? Can you spray them? Or, or yeah, they they're outside? open. They're okay. open. Then you have some the sealed ones like PEC out of Canada, mm-hmm. Precision Electronic Components. A lot of boutique guys like to use those, you know. Is there a reason why you want to use one over the other? Is it? No, is it actually? Uh, you know, cleaner? I don't know. Some of them are like hot molded carbon. They're two watt rated and stuff, whereas a regular CTS is a half a watt or whatever. Mm-hmm. You know, I don't see any significant current through any of those pots. No, not if they're like five hundred K. They're not. You know, so who cares? Right. Um, I like CTSs. I like Borns a whole lot. I tend to use CTSs in my own amps that I build the Napper series and nippers mm-hmm. and I tend to use burns in the Marshall clones and stuff of that nature. Okay. I, I like them a lot. Sockets, you talked about not no Chinese sockets. What about uh, you know where do you end up buying sockets and jacks and switches? Where or yeah, where? Uh, there's a lot of places that have them. I mean if you're looking for like NOS uh, surplus sales of Nebraska mm-hmm. has a lot of stuff. Uh, they're kind of a slipshod outfit. I mean, they're, you know, I wouldn't say they're dishonest or anything like that, but they're, they have so much stuff, Yep. you know, and if you bought like one part and you're complaining that it's not right, they don't want to fool with you. Right. You know, Yep. You know, if you bought 5,000 bucks worth of stuff and you got a problem, well, yeah, they'll get right on it. You know, right. um, there's, uh, uh, two, what are they? Uh, two tube store. I think they occasionally come up with some NOS sockets, stuff mm-hmm. like that. I like NOS preamp tube sockets, the Cinch, Michael X, uh, that uh, tan mica filled stuff like they used in the Blackface amps. Okay. Those are nice. I got about 600 of them right now. I got a deal on them, you know. Sure, sure. And, and uh, uh, power tube sockets now, believe it or not, you can do a lot better with uh, relay sockets than getting, you can with just, tube sockets. Just getting an old relay socket? Yeah. Uh, there's still companies that make those. Oh, okay. Okay, because of the repair market. I mean, there's a lot of equipment out there with relays in it. Yeah, like industrial controls yeah, and all that stuff. Yeah, you know, plant uh-huh. plant gear and stuff like yep. that. And Omron is a Japanese company. They make a dynamite octal socket. And it's still mountable really? inside a, ch- a chassis? It, Drops right in. Oh, oh, good, good. But that I didn't know that part of it. Yeah, you couldn't put that one in a fender uh, unless you want to hog the hole out a little bit. Yeah. But uh, Marshalls stuff that used the bigger, you know, looking ones, mm-hmm. it just drops right in. How do you hog holes out? Uh, I use a uh, <coughs> step drill. Okay. You know, okay. That's probably the best thing to get. I mean, a chassis punch is nicer because it doesn't make as much mess right you know and it's a more it's more elegant it makes really round holes yep you know but a set of chassis punches cost a fortune yeah i think if you got i don't know if you, you end up getting about four of those and you got some green leaves they'd be you're looking at about 350 bucks yeah and i and i have uh, a couple of chassis punches, but the the sizes I have are for punching holes for Leslie connectors. Oh, because I used to do a lot of Hammond work. Yeah, yeah. Those don't. Those aren't. They don't map to anything that you use now. Yeah, you know the they're actually the same size as an octal, mm-hmm. but the dimensions are are different. Okay, you know. You rivet stuff. You rivet no, sockets. No, never. I hate, rib- I hate rivets. Because they come loose, or no? Because everything, everything breaks, man. And you just want maintainability for. Yeah, and when it breaks, I don't want to sit around drilling out a damn rivet. That's like you know Ampeg. Uh, you get like Ampeg V4, and they riveted the damn tube sockets in. Right. Okay. And the rivets go through the tube clamps. Mm-hmm. 
Well, if you want to put something different in there, instead of 7027s, for instance, you want to put 6550s, mm-hmm. well, you have to drill out all the damn rivets to get rid of the tube clamps, because the tube clamps cannot be smacked flat enough to keep from impacting the tube base. Oh, got it. You know, so you got to drill all that out, and it's a pain in the ass. I mean, why didn't they just use screws? I, I, I just want to know what you thought about it, and your, your philosophy is it's going to... It's going to need maintenance if you want to keep it. Yeah. And all the stuff you're making now, working on now, people are proud to have it, and it will, it will always need to be worked on. Yeah, everything breaks. Yep. yep. Everything. Um, do you design any A2 or AB2 amps to drive the, no. drive the grid? Mm-mm. <clears throat> and I'm not really sure you can call me a designer. I mean, I'm an old tube hack guy, man. I was a technician in the Navy. But you, but you don't go look up a fender schematic and copy it directly. Well, if somebody wants that, I, I do. know, I know. But but when you design something, you you go, you don't, you pull from your knowledge and piece it together. You don't make a clone of your for your own designs. Well, I might take a stage out of a fender and say, well, this is the perfect way it is. That's what I want. Boom. Right. It's like legacy code for 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 guys, the programmers, yep. you know? Yep. They say, well, they put this hunk of le- legacy code there. Nobody even thinks about who wrote it. Right. Does it it's, still work? Yeah. Okay. So, you know, and uh, if you want to be technical, that's what Leo Fender did anyway. Where did he, he get, get his the, stuff? He got that stuff out of the RCA receiving tube manual. <laughs> Them old uh, Williamson circuits and, yep. you know, all that stuff. Right. I mean, because Fender, let's face it, Fender A didn't play the guitar, mm-hmm. and B, he was a TV repairman, okay. or radio repairman. Right, right. You know, so he just, just, what he was good at was making a guitar amp that would last basically forever and sound great. Whether he designed it or not is kind of problematic, you know. He made it. Do you think that they iterated towards more different sounds, or was there actually a, a lot of, uh, like what you said, he did, didn't design it, per se. Was he? Did he have enough knowledge to actually know what he wanted to tweak on the next version? Yeah. To the point where he knew a yeah, little... Yeah, and he used to, uh, he didn't play the guitar at all, and he used to, he, he could hear, you know, stuff. Mm-hmm. He knew what he was trying to hear, and he'd listen to speakers, he'd listen to tubes and stuff. And he twang his guitar open strings, mm-hmm. and it used to drive the people in the in the shop crazy. Okay, you know. So finally, somebody tuned his guitar to an open chord of some some sort, so it would sound. <laughs> and mine, which is sitting right behind me, yep, it's tuned to an open ninth. Oh, okay. <laughs> yes, yeah. I can twang it. That li- that's that's my next question. Actually, um, uh, how do you do your final checkout here? Uh, I, ha- I I listen to it myself with my single chord twang guitar, which I can bar up and down the fretboard, you know, yep. to get listen to different pitches. With your Hungarian my, whiskey bottle? Yeah, well, I don't use that, <laughs> you know. Uh, and, you know, I can, I can hit it, and I can listen to it. I can see how it sustains. I can see whether it's got a lot of harmonic swirl to it. Is it on the verge of feeding back, which is real nice. Guitar players love that, mm-hmm. you know, because it adds to the sustain and stuff. <laughs> and then I'll have one of my guys that is a dynamite player, and I have I know some guys that are incredible players. Right, come in and play it. You know, this is for this is during your design phase. Yeah, right. I want to see what it sounds like. Okay, and and uh, but you how typically how much tweaking do you do while you got the guitarist in here? Not much. Okay, and I'm you- more interested in seeing what it sounds like now. Mm-hmm. You know. And then I'll think about what I heard, and I say, well, you know, if I change this here just a little bit, yep. you know, maybe that'll go where I want it to go, you know. And then after I mess with the, the amp for a while, you know, a couple of weeks maybe, I'll, maybe I'll put it away and I'll just let it sit for a while, mm-hmm. you know. And then I'll listen to it with fresh ears, right? you know. I'll say, hey, I'll call them up say, hey, Mitch, you know, or hey, whoever, come on in and play this, you know, let's, let's see what it is. What kind of criticisms do they give? What do they tell you? What kind of things do they say? Guitarists ain't terribly expressive. You know? I mean, you, you, if I can get them, that sucks. 
You know, that's good. Okay. I like that. Yeah. <laughs> you know, that sucks. Okay. You don't like it. Let's see what the next guy says. Do you, do you do multiple people on a particular design? Sometimes, just, just... yeah. Okay. But sometimes when I get it done, you know, and and I don't have a hell of a lot of designs. I got maybe three or four. Yeah. You know, and and uh, and out of those, you know, the output stages are pretty well close to being fenders. Right. You know, there's not that many ways to do an output stage. You know, it's a preamp is what I like to mess with. You know, the tone stack and. And so you have like a pairing of uh, trans output transformers to two pairs, and and you kind of this one's going to be a six L six, this one's going to be six V six, and you all you kind of always pick the same output uh, transformer. Mm, it, it not necessarily no, because I know that if I'm looking for something that's going to be a little beefier with a little bit better bottom end, I'm going to want a heavier transformer. Mercury makes a transformer that's designed for uh, uh, deluxe reverb. Mm -hmm. It's huge. I mean, it's it's like this wide, you know. Wow. The laminations are that long, that wide. You know, you it's just absolutely it's, it's obscene looking. <laughs> you know. How do you make? How do you plan for that in your cabinet? Uh, now that I got to lay out. You know, right. I got to see how it's gonna. Like I, I, you know, for stuff that I build, I tend to build on standard chassis that I can get from Mojo or mm -hmm. whoever. Right. You know, so I take a Princeton Reverb chassis, which is a real good size. I like that size. Yep. And I'll just put the parts on top of it, you know. And I say, okay, I'm going to use this power transformer. Obviously, the hole isn't big enough, so I take a jigsaw with a metal cutting blade and I cut the hole out. Okay. You know. Excuse me. <laughs> 